So today I'm here to talk about the dark fiction I've been reading and loving recently. I talked about it in a previous video, but I'm currently trying to prepare all my end of the year content. And when it comes to dark fiction, I thought I was done reading for new releases. I thought I had a great top 10 prepared. And then I read one more new release. It's so fantastic. I have to go and rework my entire list because this one has to make the cut. And I can't wait to tell you all about it. I think a lot of you will love it if you haven't read it yet. And all that being said, let's get started. So let's give away the goods up front. And so I want to talk about this new release that I am loving, and that is Black Rivered Orchard by Czech Wendig. If you watch my top 10, 15 videos, you know that I really love this author's other work, Book of Accidents, so naturally I was very excited to pick this one up, and thankfully it did not disappoint. This is another epic piece of horror that follows multiple perspectives. The main basic setup is that we follow a father and their daughter. They are going off to the farmer's market at the beginning of the story because the father has just invented or created this different type of apple and so he's going off to sell it. His daughter wants to support him. However, she actually has an allergy to apples and so she doesn't consume them herself. But again, she wants to support him. She goes along with it. And we follow within this town different perspectives without giving away too much of the actual plot because I think it's a lot more fun to go into it semi-blind. But this is a story about a town that becomes fanatical about apples. And the whole story is just crazy over the top. So well done. The character work is fantastic. You have these really interesting interesting perspectives and you will think about apples differently after reading this book. It is just interesting. The book itself is filled with fun facts surrounding apples and our history and the different variations and I never thought I really cared about apples that much but this book made me geek out about all these apple facts I never knew and never knew that I cared about and on top of that this book is also incredibly gross and disgusting which if you know my taste in books is something that I'm saying as a compliment to the book. I love the fact that this book is incredibly gruesome in places with some really dark and messed up imagery. There are some particular scenes within the story that have stuck in my head even weeks after reading it and I know they're going to stick for a very very long time because they were just so vivid and I'm someone who doesn't always have the best ability to imagine what I'm reading on the page. I just don't have that great visual acuity for lack of a better word but this was so well described that you could not help but understand what the author was trying to convey and it's just an enjoyable story. It kind of hits on some of the tropes of a classic horror book but again not in a way that felt tired but in a way of kind of reinventing them and having a new topic. It feels smart and fun, it's topical, has some great elements of diversity woven into the story in a way that just fit and made sense and just really celebrates the wonderful world of apples in a way that I thought was so enjoyable to read about. Again, easily one of the scariest and darkest books I've read this year, which is also a huge compliment. So this book is absolutely going to make my top 10 of the year when it comes to dark fiction published in 2023. The only question which I still have to decide is exactly where it's going to go on the list. I have an idea, but I'll let you wait for that video. Next, let's talk about Eileen, which is a book I've wanted to read for quite a while. It was sent to me by a subscriber. This is a book that follows an incredibly unlikable protagonist named Eileen. Within the story, she is struggling with her family and just trying to get by. She has lots of really bad habits like stealing things and so forth. The story is set around Christmas and we follow her as she makes a friend with this other individual who works in this prison. And the story goes from there. This is one that I've seen talked about online by a lot of people that really share my personal taste in dark messed up fiction and I have read this author before I read their new release from last year Lapfona and that book is one of the most messed up books that I've ever read and I'm not sure I enjoyed it and again I can read some really messed up books that one kind of pushed my buttons in the wrong way so I went to this one a little bit apprehensive but still very excited because of all the gushing reviews thankfully in my opinion this one is much more digestible it's a little bit more accessible in a way that Lapfona to my mind is just trying to be so out there and edgy that this one in comparison felt very safe even though at the same time it has a very dark premise or at least underneath the surface there's a lot of messed up things going on. As with a book like this again the character is incredibly unlikable in a very purposeful way. If you need to relate to the main character, if you need to want to be friends with them or respect or appreciate their morals you will not get along with this book. I personally love especially women who are portrayed this way. Women who are just not likable characters. There's very little about this character that is redeemable and it's just a very twisted tale. In a way you could describe this as a thriller but that's why I'm really enjoying using the label of dark fiction because I think if you're used to reading the really buzzy thrillers that are getting published today 
I don't think that this really fills that narrative void. I don't think it's quite doing what those other thrillers are trying to do. Instead, it's doing something kind of different. It feels a little bit off kilter and doesn't follow those kind of perfect beats that you normally see with a psychological thriller that's marketed today. So I think that this book is perfect for the right reader. I didn't entirely love it, but I respected what it was doing. I can entirely see why it was gifted to me because of the fact that it hits so many of my buttons. It checks so many boxes. I liked what it was doing. It didn't quite hit the mark for me, but such a good story that you still want to check it out for yourself. Next, let's talk about Moon of the Turning Leaves by Wabashik Rice. And this is a follow-up companion story to the first book that I read by this author, which is Moon of the Crested Snow. That was one of my favorite books from the year that it came out and was published. And I've been very excited to read this follow-up story. I do recommend if you're going to check this out, you want to go back to the beginning. In that story, it starts out with some sort of apocalyptic event happening in the world. We as a reader do not know what's happening because instead the story is told in a very intimate perspective where we only get to see the story from the lens of this indigenous community up north in Canada. The power goes out, their phones stop working, and they don't really know what's happening. Eventually, we start to get tidbits and hints towards that, but really this is a story about how the community comes together and is also pulled apart by this incident, how they become a family and really have to work together. And of course, in times of these situations, as you often see in apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic situations, some people, you see their ugly side as well. And that's all explored within this story. So it's very character driven and very intimate. Love it so much. I'm a huge fan of Indigenous fiction. It's very close to my heart. And so naturally, I was very excited to see the sequel since that was an all time favorite of mine. In this one, it follows the people after the event and what they do past the events of the first book. I don't want to give away too much, but I will say that while I really appreciate this book for what it's doing, I gave it, I believe, a pretty good rating. I really respect it as a piece of Indigenous fiction. However, I'm not going to be including it on my best of the year list for dark fiction because in my mind, other than the vague setup of a post-apocalyptic future, the story doesn't have very many dark elements in it. It really reads, again, much more first and foremost as Indigenous fiction, exploring those contemporary ideas of returning back to their roots and so forth. So beautiful story. I love what it's doing. I think the writer is a fantastic wordsmith, but is it a piece of dark fiction? Is it a piece of speculative fiction? Those elements really disappeared in my mind in the second book and fell even further into the background to the point that they weren't there for me. So I love this book as someone who loves Indigenous fiction, but I can't really recommend it to my viewers if you're simply looking for suspenseful book or a piece of apocalyptic fiction, you're not really going to get what you're looking for. And I don't want someone to be reading this book with one expectations and then finding something else. Next, let's talk about The Secret History by Donna Tartt. And this is a hugely popular literary fiction novel that follows a group of students at this university. The story starts out right in the first page, it's not a spoiler, that one of the characters, one of the students is dead. And then you explore the rest of the book trying to figure out how it got to that situation. I have wanted to read this book for quite a while because again as I start to explore and expand my horizons when it comes to dark and creepy books this is one I've had my eye on because again it is always touted as being very literary it in a way is a thriller but again like other books I talk about in this video it's the kind of book that technically you could call a thriller but if you're used to reading things like the girl on the train you'll pick up a book like this and not get what you're expecting from it because while it has certain tropes it plays into it is a very rich and robust book it it did remind me quite a bit of the work of Brent Easton Ellis, specifically things like Lesson Zero. So not necessarily the horror elements, but specifically the parts about young people just doing drugs and just being unlikable and not really doing... This is a book that definitely reminded me in part to something that Brett Easton Ellis would write. So think of something like Lesson Zero, where you have these unlikable young people who don't really have a purpose and are just making their way through the world being terrible <laughs> to each other. And you definitely get that here. Again, this is a very long book and always there are certain chapters and paragraphs where I did think, oh, is this necessary? Is this moving along? But for the most part, I was very much invested in the story. I thought it was just interesting. I want to spend time with the character. And that's a big point is that if you go into this thing, it's going to be one big murder mystery of how this person got killed. It's part of the story. But if you go in, you have to be willing to really get invested with the characters. You want to spend time with them and figure out who's who and where it got to the situation that it did. And I just loved it. 
I thought the characters, again, highly unlikable, but I was very invested and interested in their stories. And it was just, it was smart. So again, written for someone like me, loved it so much, great piece of literary dark fiction. And even though I already put out my best books published before 2023 already, there's a good chance this will show up sometime in next year's videos just because I love it so much. Next, I finally read Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. And this is a book that I've just needed to read for so long. I constantly get comments on videos asking how a book compares to Interview with the Vampire. And I've never been able to make those comparisons for others because I hadn't read it myself. This is a book I held off reading because of the fact that I I didn't think I would necessarily love it given my just mediocre feelings about vampire stories in general, but I'm glad I got to it. Having finished it, I would say that it is a very traditional feeling vampire story. I understand that it's really paved the way for a lot of the modern vampire stories that came afterwards, and I respect that. The hard part is that I've read a lot of those modern books since then, and so this book felt very tropey and traditional because, again, I've read stories like it over and over again, even if this one is the one who did some of these things first. In terms of the story, I've heard the main criticism is that everyone finds the main character to be very whiny. I was pleasantly surprised and maybe it was because I went in knowing that that's the criticism, but I didn't actually find them to be that moody or brooding and just found the story to be interesting. Again, my biggest criticism of the story is just that it didn't feel very new or fresh to me. And if I just loved vampire stories for the sake of loving them, I think I would have enjoyed the story a lot more. But for me, a vampire story always has to have a twist, something different, and just being a very good vampire story isn't enough for me, unfortunately. But for other people, I completely respect it. I know a lot of people read this book when it was first coming out. Adore this book, I can see why. Had I read it how many years ago when I was a teenager, I'm sure I would have felt very differently about it. But unfortunately, I was reading Twilight during those years. I also read The Vegetarian by Hang Kong, and this is a translated weird fiction horror book that follows a young woman who decides that she can no longer eat or consume different animal products. At first, it starts out with more of a vegetarian diet and then leans into what you would more describe as vegan and we see the story partially from her husband's perspective, not understanding why she's doing this, and the story goes from there. Myself as someone who has a complicated relationship with food, a history of an eating disorder, I went to this book hoping that it would be a big allegory for those conversations surrounding restricted eating disorders. However, this book is just not trying to do that, so I was a little bit disappointed simply based off my own expectations. From there, I appreciated parts of the story loosely. I will admit, and I'm learning this more and more I read, that I like the idea of weird fiction a lot more than I actually like reading it. And this story, instead of again being a topical conversation about women and food and a lot of the things I love in books like The Edible Woman by Margaret Atwood, instead in this one, it just felt like it was just weird for the sake of weird. I wasn't entirely sure what the author was trying to accomplish, what theme or message were they trying to bring across to the reader because it wasn't what I expected and I'm not really sure what they were going for. So very unsatisfying read for me, very disappointing. Hopefully other people love it, but I didn't. And finally, I read Frankenstein in Baghdad. And this is a translated horror book that I want to read ever since finishing Frankenstein. There are several retellings that I want to check out, but I thought I should read the original classic first before I went on to retellings. As again, I think it makes sense to read it in that order. This is a story that is set in obviously Baghdad, specifically during the US occupation. And this story follows a man who goes around collecting body parts of those that have been killed in different bombings and assaults. And he says he's doing it because he wants to show or present these perhaps to the US to help and get them properly buried. However, you find out that perhaps there's something else going on, perhaps he is building something, and so you kind of get where this is going based off of the Frankenstein narrative. In terms of the story, reading that premise years ago, I remember thinking that this was gonna be this gruesome, messed up, twisted story of a man collecting body parts, and the person inside of me who loves body horror was very excited. Since then, I've read more reviews, and I kind of knew what I was getting myself into, so I picked up this book, and it's very literary in nature. It definitely reads in a lot of ways like contemporary fiction, or at this point, historical fiction addressing a very important and serious political information surrounding again this occupation and what happens to civilians in these occupations and so forth. So this is a very topical book that has some very cutting opinions surrounding that occupation and definitely has some points that the author is trying to make within it. I really enjoyed or appreciated what it was trying to do there. In terms of a horror book, 
those aspects are there, but again, it's much more nuanced and quiet in a way that the story is a slower build. And you really have to appreciate and enjoy literary fiction or to enjoy this one, in my opinion, because I do think that it is really written as an allegory to express the author's feelings towards a lot of the political situation that was happening at that time period. So a book that I appreciate what it was doing a little bit more than I personally enjoyed it, but I do think it's a very worthwhile book if you're looking to read more horror in translation or horror that deals with a part of the world at a time period that you don't see covered in this manner too often. It's very compelling in that way. So again, liked what it was doing. Did I have the best time reading it ever? Not necessarily, but it's a really heavy topic. So I could argue that maybe I wasn't supposed to have a blast reading it when such serious subject matter is being addressed. So that's it for this video here. I'd love to know the books I talked about. Which ones are you planning on checking out for yourself? And also, if you just want to leave a fun comment, let me know what is your favorite type of apple. If you enjoyed this video and want to stick around, I hope you subscribe. I do read a lot of horror, thriller, science fiction, fantasy, and other dark things. If you want to help me out here more, you can give me a thumbs up, drop a comment, even if it's just an apple emoji, that's great. If you want to hit that little notification bell, you'll never miss a video from me. Thanks so much for watching. Talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.